It has a lace pink dress. It's a bit creepy once you know where the doll came from. It gives me the heebie-jeebies. This figurine, handcrafted by an inmate, has a shocking and twisted story to tell. This doll is linked to a tragic tale of greed and murder. It's October 17th, 1930, in Denver, Colorado. Police Chief Captain A.T. Clark has a troubling new case on his desk. The body of a young girl has been found floating in a nearby lake. She is identified as 10-year-old Leona O'Loughlin. Leona was from a prominent upper middle class family in Denver. She was described as being very sweet, always very well behaved. Leona's father, Lou, happens to be a member of the police department. When Captain Clark speaks to Lou and Leona's stepmother, Pearl, he learns that Leona has been missing for three days. Pearl says she last saw her stepdaughter when she tucked her in for bed. Pearl said that she put Leona to bed about 8.30. When Leona didn't come down for breakfast the next morning, Pearl knew something was wrong. At first, Clark considers the possibility that the girl's death is nothing more than an unforeseeable tragedy. It could have been just an accident. Captain Clark thought maybe she had just wandered off on her own, gotten lost, and drowned. But an examination of the body reveals a more sinister possibility. She couldn't have drowned because there was no water in her lungs. The girl's death may not have been an accident at all, but rather murder. But who would want to kill this child, and why? Clark zeroes in on bruising found on her body during the autopsy and orders a toxicology report. He wonders if Leona was targeted because her father is a cop. He may have made enemies in the local criminal fraternity. Captain Clark knew that Detective O'Loughlin had been cracking down on some bootleggers. He thought that maybe her father had gotten on the wrong side of somebody who wanted retaliation. But none of the potential suspects has anything that would connect them to the crime. And without further evidence, the investigation stalls. Captain Clark began to worry that the killer may never be found. Then the toxicology report comes back with an astonishing clue that will crack the case wide open in the strangest of ways. Inside the young girl's body, the medical examiner has detected an unnerving clue. She found a teaspoon of ground glass. Then, as Clark tries to figure out how the girl would have ingested glass, he gets a call from Leona's grandfather. Leona's grandfather came forward with his own shocking new evidence. According to Dennis O'Loughlin, a few weeks earlier, he had noticed something strange at his son Leo's house when he ate a spoonful of sugar. The grandfather realized immediately that the texture of the sugar was off. So he spit it in the sink, poured some water on it, and was shocked to see that some of it didn't dissolve. Confused by this discovery, he saved some of the granules. And when Captain Clark has them examined, he finds the key piece of evidence. It was actually ground glass mixed with the sugar granules. The police chief concludes that Leona could have died from ingesting ground glass. Then, in a further twist, he learns that Leona's father is also now in the hospital. Not long after she disappeared, Leo fell violently ill. In fact, there is only one person in the household who hasn't fallen sick, Leona's stepmother. Captain Clark brought in Pearl for questioning. After hours of intense scrutiny, Pearl finally cracked and confessed. Investigators conclude that Pearl fed the glass to Leona, struck her on the head, and dumped her body in the lake. Pearl O'Loughlin is charged with poisoning her husband and murdering her stepdaughter. And as for motive, she was after the family's money. The police found the motive to be basic greed. Pearl's husband, Leo, had a life insurance policy, and Leo's father was very well off. In Pearl's mind, if she got rid of the grandfather, Leo, and Leona, that all that money would come to her. 
The ruthless killer is convicted of first-degree murder and sentenced to life in prison. She spends 20 years in jail reflecting on her cruel misdeeds and passing the time crafting figurines using human hair. Today, one of her creations sits within the collection of the Museum of Colorado Prisons in Canyon City. It recalls a wicked stepmother's sweet and sordid scheme and the young girl who tragically fell victim. This 1940s era radio receiver is connected to a chilling tale that has terrified sailors for decades. This is a story about a ghost ship on the high seas. Maritime history is filled with amazing stories of giant squid, bloodthirsty pirates, and phantom ships. But possibly the strangest of all is that of a vessel named the Orang Medan. It all begins in June 1947. An American merchant ship named the Silver Star is just west of Malaysia when the radio operator picks up a disturbing SOS. This was no ordinary distress signal. It was Morse code with an incredibly ominous and in many ways terrifying message. The transmission reads, all officers, including the captain, are dead, lying in chart room and bridge, possibly whole crew dead. And then at the very end of the distress signal, it simply said, I die, and then trailed off into nothing. The transmission appears to be coming from a Dutch freighter sailing off the shores of Malaysia's west coast. It's called the Orang Medan. Alarmed, the Silver Star's crew sets a course towards the stricken ship. The captain of the American ship that received this signal knew that he had to get there as soon as he could. If this message was to be believed, urgency was imperative. But when the Silver Star reaches the allegedly distressed vessel, it looks perfectly intact. What they find is sort of bewildering. This ship just sort of drifting aimlessly. There's not a soul in sight, but neither is there any visible damage to the hull. The Americans decide it's time to board this ship and figure out what exactly went down here. The captain of the Silver Star brings a search party on board the Orang Medan. There, the men are met with a horrifying scene. Strewn about the deck are the corpses of the crew members, each one with a look of terror frozen on his face. This is like something out of a horror movie. Inexplicably, there were all of these dead bodies, but no wounds, no signs of struggle, no sign of anything. The cause of death was a total mystery. Before the crew of the Silver Star can investigate further, they spot smoke billowing from below and quickly evacuate. They make it back to their ship just in time. The Orang Maiden exploded, and what was left of it plummeted beneath the waves, never to be seen again. The crew of the Silver Star files a report about the disturbing event with the American Coast Guard. But when officials investigate, they find yet another bewildering fact. The Orang Medan isn't listed on any national registry of ships. There was no paperwork for the ship or even any confirmation that it existed. In the years that follow the alleged incident of 1947, the Orang Medan becomes a nautical legend, capturing the imagination of sailors and historians alike. For decades, rumors, legends, stories of this ship spread. As the years went on, more and more theories came out, each more outlandish than the last, and many people began to believe that the truth would never emerge. So what really happened to this ghost ship? More than four decades after the discovery of the Orang Medan, the startling secret of the mysterious tragedy that befell its crew is finally revealed. It's connected to a sinister Japanese plan to develop weapons of mass destruction during World War II. 
the highly covert initiative was known as Unit 731. This story was about to go from weird to weirder. These Japanese researchers have been working on biological warfare, really top secret stuff. In 1945, Japan surrendered to the Allies and Unit 731 was officially disbanded. However, some believe that a few members of the program decided to go rogue and cash in. These renegade scientists are thought to have smuggled potassium cyanide and nitroglycerin onto merchant ships such as the Orang Medan. Because the mission was so secretive, well, they would have used a false ship registry. It's speculated that the toxins stored in oil drums could have leaked out and caused the Dutch ship's tragic downfall. Whatever chemicals were on board could have been incredibly volatile, which would explain what killed the crew on board and why the ship exploded. Though this story offers the most likely explanation for the odd encounter, the whole truth behind the ill-fated Orang Medan may never be known. It's understandable why this mystery has lingered. I mean, this is the stuff of nightmares. Despite years of research, nobody has been able to prove conclusively that this ship even existed. Today, this Morse radio receiver, just like the one used to pick up the Orang Medan's distress signal, is on display at the New Jersey Maritime Museum in Beach Haven. It acts as a chilling reminder of a mysterious ghost ship that may still haunt the ocean. Discovery.